We're going to deal today with a uh, with the doctrine of good works. Say good works. Good works. good works. They come in all shapes and sizes, don't they? I remember years ago, my wife sent me on a mission. She says, now I want you to go to Tuesday morning store. Tuesday morning. So, like the obedient husband that I am, I quickly mounted my chariot and drove to the store, only to find out that it wasn't open that day, but it will be open the next day. So, like the obedient husband that I am, I went the next day. So I'm sitting in the front of this store. I want you to get the picture. I'm sitting in front of the store waiting for it to open. I'm there bright and early. First one there, actually. And so uh, that's impressive, isn't it? So uh, I, saw the, I saw the guy inside. He was kind of milling around. He was going to unlock the door. So I just got out of my car and I went up there and I had my hand on the door and he unlocked it, and suddenly there was this precious lady to my left there. So I just, oh, my daddy taught me chivalry, okay? You open doors for women. By the way, there's, there's an interesting phenomenon going on. Let me digress a moment. There's something about getting old and women start opening the doors for you. I'm loving this. I don't know... I think they, they think that you're no longer a threat. <laughs> so, so, hey, man, women open the door for me. I said, God bless you. So anyway, meanwhile, back at Tuesday morning, I've got my hand on the door. I open the door, and this lady walks through, and she felt good, and so did I. And then here was another lady, and, and she walked through, and she felt good, and so did I. And... I realized that there were 28 women, maybe 38, I don't know. And so I'm standing here holding the door where one after another, after another, after another goes through the door. Now here's my problem. Kay sent me to get a specific, what was it, some kind of comforter. And, you know, she, she even had the serial number thing and told me where it was in the store. And, I mean, we, we had all this mapped out. Well, by the time 412 women go through the door, <laughs> and I'm still looking, they had these, these compartments over on the, on the wall, and I saw the comforter that was destined to be mine. And then I saw this little old lady. She reaches into the compartment and gets my comforter. Nobody warned me how these women shop. I mean, so I rushed over there and I grabbed this little lady and I threw her down. No, I didn't really do that. I, no, I, I didn't really do that, but. She took the comforter out of her basket and put it back in the deal. Hallelujah. That means I can go home. Successful. Good works. Sometimes good works are a little hard to understand, aren't they? So but we're going to understand them today. I want you to look with me to the Psalms chapter 40, if you would, please. Psalms chapter 40. I'm going to read verses 7 through 10. Then I said, David's writing this, Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. Now, I think it's interesting. 
that David understands that his name, his reference personally, is in the Word of God. I wish you and I understood that. For when we see a promise of God, we put our name on that thing. Somebody shout amen, amen. with me. Amen. They have your name on them. Amen. Glory to God. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will. I delight to say it with me. Do. Do your will. Oh my God, and your law is written in my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O oh Lord, you yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. Now I want you to see what David is proclaiming about himself for just a moment. David says, I proclaim the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Do you see that? He's vocal about it. Remember a young man came to church one time and he visited three or four times and and he said he wanted to talk to me, and so we arranged for a time for him to come in, and we sat down and began to chat. And, uh, he said, uh, now I want you to know, Reverend, I want you to understand this. He says, now I'm one who practices my Christianity silently. By the way, I used that same one on a preacher one time myself when I uh, was not exactly following the ways of God. Want to, uh, I, want to, I want to practice my Christianity silently. Closet Christian. Is there a problem with that? Is there a problem with that? David said, I proclaim you outwardly, see. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to understand that we have a responsibility as believers to make sure that everyone around us knows our Jesus. And we're going to see how we go about doing that very thing. Go to that next, that next screen, if you would, Deacon. Now you see... There's all kinds of good works, right? We can, we're here to serve one another, to be helpful, to shine in the darkness, and yes, even to preach and teach. And I'm not talking about ordained ministers. Mm. Oh, come on, preacher. You don't expect me to be a preacher. Now, I don't expect you to find yourself a pulpit somewhere. But in your workplace, so you can be the mouthpiece of God. So I think it's interesting that in my lifetime, I've seen a major shift in Christianity. And you probably recognize it as well. Over the last two or three decades, our Christian faith has pretty much focused on what it can do for us. Have you noticed that? The songs oftentimes that are sung, the sermons that we hear preached, the teachings that all focus on God here, do this for, for me. Give me. Now let me tell you one of the reasons why I believe that's happened. It's happened because we, have, we went through several hundred years of not even understanding our covenant with God that we could even receive, really receive right, right. from God. Right. So it was almost a knee-jerk reaction. Hagen used to say we jump in one bar ditch and then we jump clear over in the other bar ditch. We don't, we don't stay in the center of the, of the lane here. And that's what happened, see? So we needed to have a time when we recognized that God's promises have our names on them, that He really does want to do good things for us. Amen. It's like we talked about last week, receiving from God is not an optional thing, it's something that's necessary. Amen. So that those things that God has promised 
we can utilize them to bring glory to Him. Come on, say amen, amen. with me. Amen. So what we've had is we've had a Christian faith geared to me, myself, and I. And God is saying to His people now for a season, I allowed this to happen. Now listen to me. He said, for a season I allowed this to happen because it needed to have the revelation that you have the fullness of the things of God in your life. That needed to be imparted to the church. But he said, now there's some shifting gears. The Holy Spirit's talking here. Are you going to listen? Yes. Amen. He's saying, now it's time for you to get off the pew and begin to do. Begin to do. Go to that next screen. What we're going to look at is one, one thing. We're way, way gone. Take me back to the black screens. We're, I'm not sure how you got there. There you go. That's what I'm looking for. Down the book of Ephesians, Paul really gives us some strong foundation for this thing of good works. Now look what, look what Jesus says to us through him. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Shout amen with me. Amen. That not of your works, amen. not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are, now watch, we are his what? Workmanship. In other words, think of this, think of the craftsmen building and designing and molding this particular thing or at the hand of God creating something so it says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what reason good for good works good works good works those things good definition Good works. Those things that you do in the name of Jesus for someone else. Are you with me? Yes. The things that you do in the name of the Lord Jesus, you do it for His glory. But remember, you're doing it not for you. You're doing it for Him. Now think about this a moment. Had you been one of the 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and you had just experienced the most powerful thing that you had ever encountered in your life, which was the impartation of the Spirit of God, everything in you would want to sequester you and your group in that room and remain in the, as we sang a moment ago, remain in the presence of the Lord. Wouldn't it? I mean, I can't even imagine what that would really feel like. So the tendency that Christians have is that if they have really have an encounter with God, I'm talking about one of those barn burners. You know what I mean, don't you? A really significant thing. You want to stop right there and enjoy it and bask in it and hope it never ends. But you soon find out that it's like it dissipates. Just like on that day of Pentecost, those people, they were destined to encounter the power of the risen Savior. But then what does it say they did immediately? They went out into the streets and began to proclaim what they had experienced. See, that shows us, that's a model for what for us to follow. Amen. Is that when we encounter these tremendous things of God, they are meant to empower us to do the works of the Lord. God is saying to you and me, now listen carefully. He's saying, I've put my spirit in you. I've anointed you. Amen. Empowered you. Not to sit on pews. We sit on pews for a couple hours a week so that we can be revitalized. We can be taught. We can learn. We can worship. And all those things build us up 
so that we can go out and be. Hallelujah. So Paul here, he's saying now, God prepared these things. I want you to notice closely what he says. He says that God prepared these good works beforehand. I was headed for church one Sunday morning a bunch of years ago. Stopped at 63rd and MacArthur to fill up my car with gas. We lived over in that neighborhood then. And I was about halfway through filling my car with gas and this, this lady pulls in to the tank, on, to the pump on the other side of the, the uh, pump. And uh, she was kind of fiddling around with the purse, kind of trying to figure out, I guess, do I have any money or whatever. And just as clear as you're sitting there, the Holy Spirit says to me, I want you to go in and tell the man at the attendant that whatever she buys, you're buying. Okay? So she starts filling up her tank, and I, I was hanging around there waiting on the inside for it to get over. For, her, for us to get a total so I could pay the man. And so finally, we got it all said and done. And I wanted to leave before she knew that it was me that did it. Because I want, I want Jesus to have glory for this thing. I didn't make it out before she recognized what happened. He told her. She comes running out to the car, tears streaming down her face. She says, sir, I know that you don't know me. She says, I'm a pastor of a Pentecostal church in Midwest City, or Dell City, one of, over in that area. And she said, uh, when I got up this morning, I realized that I didn't have very much money and what I did have, I wanted to give to the Lord, but I was gonna have to put it in my tank. And she said, furthermore, I was at the point, this blessed me. She says, I was at the point where I was so discouraged with the ministry. She says, I was ready to quit. And I told the Lord, she says, I told the Lord, you got to show me a sign, some sign that your anointing, your blessings are still on my ministry. And she says, sir, what you did today was that sign from God. Amen. Wow. Hallelujah. You know, those little things that we do for others, what really happens, the good works are really a revealing of the nature of God by his kids. Do you know that? that they show people what your God is really all about. Amen. We're in a cultural war right now between good and evil, aren't we? Have you noticed? And one of the great criticisms of evangelical Christians is that they believe that we're hateful. That we hate people. If they don't believe like we do, we, they believe that we hate them. And that's nonsense, isn't it? Now, we might hate a sin that they're involved in, but we love them. Amen? So what we have happening is the more they see supposed Christians out there screaming and yelling at people because they don't feel their acceptability level, they need to hear that Jesus really is a God of love. They need to see it. Now, how in the world are they going to see the love of God if you and I don't portray it? See, I was teaching in a Bible college class one time, and the people wanted to know the question. They said, well, why is it that in the Old Testament that God demonstrated His might and His power by splitting Red Seas and uh, 
you know, axe heads floating and all kinds of miraculous and dynamic manifestations. And he, they said, in, and he apparently doesn't do that kind of thing now. And why is that? And I said, well, there's a difference that uh, we have now that he didn't have then. I said, then God needed to operate almost apart from mankind. Now, he still used prophets and priests and kings, didn't he? Yeah, right. But you see, he had to operate sovereignly because at that point, mankind was not filled with the Spirit of God like we are now. Right. And so in this dispensation, in this period that we're in, the church age, everything that shows God to the world must come through his church. Everything. If God's going to show His love to people, it's got to come through the saints. If God's going to show that He's kind and He's gentle, it's got to come through the saints. If He's going to show that He's generous, guess who it's got to come through? The saints of God. So you and I have a responsibility. A responsibility to be that one through whom God can operate. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. I want you to look in verses 12 and 13. 1 Peter chapter 2. See, one thing that we learn when we're, when we're in Bible college or when we're in seminary is that when God over and over says something about a particular subject, the more often times He deals with it, we reckon that the more important the thing is. Are you tracking with me? If, he's, if he mentions something one time, it's not that it's not important, but it's not as important as something that he would mention over and over and over. Okay? Now, over and over and over, I'm going to show you here in Scripture, he's going to talk about good works. See, this, the Ephesians 2 passage that we just looked at is kind of the anchor passage when a minister wants to, to teach on good works. But there are many, many passages in Scripture that show us this is heavy on God's mind. Now let's just t let's t take a thought for a moment. When Jesus was on the earth, He gets up in the morning just like you and me, right? So what do we see him doing from the moment he sets foot out of the bed until he lays his head on the bed again that night? What do you see him doing? Is he lounging on the front porch? Playing golf? You know, hanging out with the boys at the, at the restaurant drinking coffee? We see him about the father's business. Now, Here's a, here, here's a news flash. His daddy is the same daddy you got. Mm -mm -mm. Amen. Same Papa. Jesus over and over again would say Father. He refers to him as his Father. And he's implying that he's also your Father. Now look what Peter, Peter builds on this concept. Let's look at it. Read this with me having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, by the way, they're going to, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, see, they're going to see it, which they observe glorify God in the day of salvation. Or visitation, I'm sorry. When they see something, now, we're seeing evil and good in direct confrontation now at every level, aren't we? I mean, big time. There's no more gray area left. Some of us grew up in the time when there was a much gray area. The, the right, or the good was way over there and the, and, the, and the bad was way over here. And then there was this massive gray area, but boy, that's gone now. It's very obvious who's on which team, right? So the good works 
that people would have who are people of God are those things that are going to demonstrate who God really is. And the, the mindset that most people who do not know Christ, the mindset is that God is some ogre. He's sitting up there waiting to put the crush on you the moment you do something bad. And people, that couldn't be further than the truth. Oh, you've got a daddy that loves mankind, the worst sinner. God loves the worst sinner as much as he does you and me. His creation is so important to him. So here Peter is saying now, they're going to observe your good works. They're going to see there's something going on in you and through you that's different than other people. Am I right? Now here's, what, here, here's my question. When we do surveys, I've, it's been several years since I've seen one, but I don't think things have changed all that much. When we see surveys that ask the question, how many people have you led to Christ in, the, in your lifetime? Or maybe the question would be in the last year or whatever. The percentage of people that respond positively to that is extremely low. In fact, horribly low. And then the question is asked, why is it there's a reluctance on most Christians' parts to speak out and witness to the Lord Jesus in the lives of others and to tell them about what he's all about and to demonstrate kindness in the name of Christ? What's the reluctance? And almost without fail, they say things like, well, I don't feel like I'm, uh, I'm qualified. What if they ask me about whatever? And I don't know how to answer them, see. Or what if they reject me? What if, if, I, if I say something about Christ and, and they don't like it and they start making fun of me, what... What am I going to do? They're mocking me. That you know. Oh, I don't think I can stand that kind of rejection. Folks, we better toughen up. Yeah. We better toughen up. Our life in Christ Jesus has nothing to do with popularity, does it? It has nothing to do with whether or not those people like us. It has everything to do with them liking Jesus. Now, just as sure as you start on this path, you need to know up front that just as it was with Jesus, just as it was with Paul, for example, two illustrations, that there are going to be people that resist us. And they're going to call you naughty names. They're going to disparage your heritage. They're going to mock your God. And, but you're just going to keep on keeping on, aren't you? I always love the thought where in one situation, Paul, they hated Paul so bad, they took him outside of town and stoned him to death. And they, they see him laying there and bloodied and everything. They think it's all over with, so they all go home. He gets up and goes to the next town and starts preaching again. <laughs> Boy, he's one tough little rascal, isn't he? He's passionate about what he's doing. Yes. That's the thing that we're lacking. That's right. We're lacking a passion, passion for seeing Jesus moving beyond the walls of the church Amen. into the marketplace, into the recreational areas, yes. into government. Oh, God help us. Yes. Into the educational sector, yes. into media and entertainment. Yes. That's right. We have got to see that the kingdom of God needs to permeate absolutely every aspect of our culture. And it cannot happen without us. Wow. Let me show you another one. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to look in verses 24 and 25 with me. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us consider one another. Let me stop a moment. Remember 
Christianity is not just about you and me. Christianity is about how you and I interact with those around us as much as it is the vertical relationship that we have with God. Everybody got it? So let us consider one another in order to stir up love and what? Love and what? Good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more the day as you see the day approaching. Now what's the writer of Hebrews really saying to us? What's he really saying? What's the underlying thing here? He's, under, he's, he's saying to us that our, our human nature, now remember that part of us is not born again, is it? Your spirit man is what's born again. Your physical body is not born again, neither is your soulish man. Your mind, your will, your emotions. So here, when the writer says, consider one another, he is saying, I know that you're just like me and you're going to have times when you want to quit or you want to back up or sit down. But if you are tied into a group of people who are people of faith, I believe like this group, then there's going to be this mutual encouragement, isn't there? There's going to be this, come on, you can make it. See, sometimes every one of us, if I was a betting man, I'd say everyone in this house, there are times when we feel weak. We feel like, oh, I just don't want to, you know, I, I just can't go any further or this or that's going on. And we need someone else to speak into our lives, don't we? Do you know those speaking into one another's lives, those are good works. Those are good works. In fact, it's kind of like the fruit of the Spirit. Now, don't you think it's interesting that when God has Paul write about the fruits of the Spirit, he uses the term fruit. See? Can't you just see this tree with fruit hanging off of it? Now, let me ask you a real theological question. Does the tree eat its own fruit? Now, think of, you know, this, I know it's hard, but, but think about it. Does the tree eat its own fruit? No. See, picture you, you've got this fruit hanging all over you. And some, someone comes along and takes that banana of kindness, let's say. And because you have been kind, they are increased. They are enhanced because of it. I had an interesting thing happen. Uh, Kay and I went to the post office to, to get the mail. And I got out and I was going in and like the chivalrous man that I am, I'm lay holding the door for this lady. Thank God there wasn't a hundred more coming along. <laughs> and just as she got to the door, she stopped and she looked right at me and she said, can I fix your collar? I guess my collar was, you know, I don't know what was going on with it. She kind of, I don't know this woman. She just kind of fixed it and she just walked on. That was cool. That was really cool. That was a fruit of the Spirit. That was a good work. Now, that's a small thing, isn't it? But all day long, I just kept thinking, Lord, you are good to me. If you're even concerned about how my collar looks, you know I know I'm cool, and you got to be, you got to have it all together when you're cool. Everybody say Amen. amen. It's kind of like Butch, you know. Look at him; he's always just prim and proper and all this, you know. I try to be like Butch. And one of these days, when I grow up, I'm going to be just like him. Fruit. People come along and you have a word that you've spoken to them that's encouraging to them. There's a good work that you're doing right then. 
and they're going to be better for it. One of the things that we're missing in local churches, not here, because I believe God's put together a group of people that understand what a church is all about. But a church is a family. And so we carry one another's burdens, don't we? We increase one another and enhance our lives because of the person next to us. But so many churches, in fact, this is something we want to guard against as we grow. The larger the church, the less likely you are going to see that, that close-knit, you know what I'm saying, that, uh, yeah. that family mindset. Yes. We're going to have to work even harder than ever. Right now, at this size, it's not hard, but you got to put more into it. You get several hundred, several thousand, it's going to take some effort. Amen. But God is saying to his church today, I have designed you to be workers. I've designed you to be workers. And he says, remember this, I designed your works at the foundation of the earth. Yes. Wow. Amen. That day that he had me fill the ladies' tank with gas, yeah. that wasn't my idea. That was God's idea. And it was his idea way back before there was time. I wonder what he's going to have you do tomorrow. Amen. Wow. Yeah. I mean, people, those good works, they are everywhere waiting to be done. They are already ordained in your life. Let's be that people. Let's be that group that says, yeah, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm ready to go. See, no matter what we're doing, we're going to be the light in the darkness. Do you know, by the way, do you know that we have a world-famous distance runner in our church? Stand up for just a minute, Penny. <laughs> Can you imagine running a 5K, 5-kilometer five race? This is what this woman does for fun. Wow. All right, now... You, you can sit down, Miss Athlete. Can't, while she's out there doing one of these things, running on that, that's crazy. Why does anybody want to run it? Wow. Wow. But she's running out there. See, even in that environment, she can be the light in the darkness, can't she? What about your bowling league? You can be the light and the darkness in the bowling alley, right. at the workplace, at Walmart store, right over there by the Maters. You can be the light. But we're going to have to change the way we think. We're not serving God by attending church. Hmm. That's right. That's right. We're going to think about that in a minute. We're not serving God because we come to church. We're serving God. Remember what Jesus said? When you've done it to one of the least of these, what did he say? You've done it as unto me. When you minister to that person, no matter who it is, for, for what reason, but when you minister to that person, you might as well be doing it directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that pleases him and blesses him. Now see, I think for evangelical Christians, every one of us knows that we are saved by grace through faith. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Not of works. We talked about it a moment ago. Not of works. So we have taken the not of works and said, hmm, okay, I don't have to do anything. There one, one, one man told me, he said, uh, I'm, I'm biblically sound. I am resting in the Lord. <laughs> that meant I'm doing nothing for the Lord. People, there is there's such personal satisfaction 
when you minister to someone, particularly someone that doesn't know you and you don't know them, and outside of the church, that's where we've got to shine the best. Now, I want us to carry one another's burdens inside the church, don't you? But folks, we can, we can do so much to advance the kingdom of God if we will just be constantly aware of who's around us and the situations there. Oh, the Lord's saying, rise up, church. He's saying prophetically, rise up, church, for my glory is on you. And people are going to see that glory. See that day that Peter and John, the first recorded hit, uh, miracle that they themselves were involved in. Do you remember the man that was sent daily at the gate of the temple? Now, if we, if we read that passage, we see that once he's up and running and, and, it's, and, it's, and he's going in, everybody that's ever been in Jerusalem had seen this man sitting there for 20 or 30 years. And it said they glorified the Lord because of it. Because they saw the manifestation of the power of God. Then they knew that those two men that, that produced this, they couldn't possibly have done this on their own. So what does it say? They glorified the Lord Jesus. We're going to bring glory to the Lamb of God every time we do something for somebody else. So remember this, your Christianity doesn't just mean you. You are a vessel. You are a builder of the kingdom. You are the conduit through which the love of Jesus flows from his throne to the world. You're the mouthpiece of God. You're the one that's going to make the difference because of your life. Let's pray. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to quicken each of us. Put a divine stimulation, a divine motivation in each of us to truly be the salt that changes every situation. That we become truly the light in the darkness so the people can see you through us. Lord, we know there's a world out there that's lost. And many are dying. And they're headed for an eternity in the flames of fire if someone doesn't speak to them. If we don't somehow reveal you to them, they may never know about the one true God. Put it in our hearts and in our minds, my Lord. Quicken us. Make us constantly aware that we can be the difference maker in every scenario that we find ourselves in. Raise up this church. Raise up these ones who will see this by internet. Every one of us here being encountered with this truth, put it in our hearts to rise up strong in the anointing of the Spirit and begin to do the works of the kingdom. I claim it done, and I rejoice ahead of time for it. Oh, for it's in the name of the Lord, I pray these things. Can you say amen?